Est-ce qu'un monde de foi Catholic 156 She's a remarkable woman for any age. Yes, Claremont de Foy. She was one of those standouts. I mean, there's some powerful women around at the time. Eleanor of Aquitaine, uh, Emma Gard of Dabon, to name a few. But not many were regarded as a goddess in their own time. Talk about being a legend in your own time, being a legend in her time. <laughs> Lots of reasons for this being so. I have a poem about her later, but first just a few details. Both her and her brother had flaming, very bright, flaming red hair. Uh, she was born in Bois, the Chateau, in 1155, and she lived to the right old age of 80. She was very spiritual right from the beginning, at around 13. She already dedicated herself to Catharism. She, as regards her looks, I checked and the closest face to come up with in looks was the Italian film star, Gina Le the uh, Lotta Brigida, a good looking woman. So she had a similar face there. But being a redhead, she had very white skin. She was two inches taller than the average. So she was five foot seven uh, at the time, 170 uh, centimetres. Uh, she had hazel eyes. So that was, it was a little bit brown, but with flecks of green and, and blue. A very attractive woman indeed, and she had red hair, and as, like the Cathar women, it flowed right down her back. She married uh, a little late, later than usual. She married at 21. Uh, women often married earlier than that. She married a, a Lord Jourdain, the Lille Jourdain, uh, a Lord of that area. And she raised six children. But uh, she became a widow and she then uh, became a female parfait. She dedicated the rest of her life to being a Cathar priestess, priest. But she was remarkable because her and her sister, her elder sister, Philippa, they started the first school for girls, and hospital. She uh, had a number of hospitals. This was uh, the Catholic Church <laughs> uh, to become relevant because they were becoming irrelevant. Copied the Cathars uh, in, in, uh, in hospitals and things like that, but it was actually es Esclamond who started hospitals, uh, school for girls, uh, uh, an old people's home for uh, uh, aging uh, parfait women and widows, Cathar widows. So these are these are European firsts. Uh, no doubt, possibly she had the ideas because the Saracens, the the the, 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 the Muslims in the in the east, in, in in when the Crusaders went over there, they found, oh my God, the, these people took prisoners. Oh, they have hospitals. <laughs> they had uh, mathematics and medicine. So. A lot of these ideas came back now, uh, but whether they, whether that was taken, the idea was taken from from the Saracens or not, it doesn't matter. The plain fact is that she put them into practice, and she had a number of hospitals and homes uh, and schools and so forth. 
So this is remarkable stuff. <laughs> so of course, when uh, she was uh, begun as a, as a fox, probably the red fox, I don't know, uh, by the church, but uh, she was uh, number one, uh, number one on their wanted list. And so they hunted her. The church wanted her, dead or alive. Now they wanted her dead, uh, and uh, they hunted her for, for some some thirty years. So that's a little bit of the background. So I'll. It's time for poem, my poem, uh, Esclaremont de Foix. Esclaremont de Foix. Once, when the moon rose up from under the sea, to sail over those wild mountains, the Pyrenees. While in Foix, a baby was born to grow to fame, light of the world. Escaramond was her name. In that shadow positioned up above Foy Town, the babe born there would be of great renown. She grew in beauty as well in wit and in charm. She always tried to save people from any harm. She married, of course, then raised her family, but later she set out to become spiritually free. This Clermont, she started Europe's first hospital, the first widow's home, also a girls' school. This Clermont was a Cathar lady of distinction, for she loved each and all without any condition. In 1209, the Crusaders' arrival, it created a hell. Albigensian crusade, Catharism's death knell. When the crusading army failed their annihilation, then Pope Innocent III started his Holy Inquisition. Esclaramond, high on the Inquisition's most wanted, for more than 30 years she was constantly hunted. Though evading being caught by the church, finally, at 80 years old, she became too frail to flee. In a small village in the Arige, it was then time to die. At her death, a white dove hovered, then flew to the sky. In that world of spirit, her Catharism still carries on, with Cathar unconditional love that's for everyone. There, with other holy ones, she guides us on still, to make sure that the Balabas prophecy is fulfilled. I think the poem says it all. The thing about poetry is that one can waffle on, one can read an essay, but it's often a cartoon or a, or a poem that can actually uh, lodge it in our brain. But she, uh, she was pursued, hunted, by the Catholic Church Inquisition and she managed to evade them for some 30 odd years and this is because uh, she was in the area of the Arige, the Arige Valley and the place there were, there were quite apart from the fact that she had uh, friends uh, there were also caves to, to, to hide in. The place is literally riddled with caves. There's a few photographs to show you of the area. And caves were of major importance to the Cathars at that time for the simple reason was that the Inquisition, the Inquisitors, the Dominicans, if they knew that a, a Cathar had, was buried in a certain, a certain spot, they went over, disinterred them, dug them up, <laughs> and then burnt them at the stake, and burnt them. So they didn't want any Cathars around. And then when they burnt, they got their ashes and scattered their ashes. So there was 
there was a there was no actual physical place that they, they could go and say, well, that's where the Cathars would be buried. The Cathars resorted, they had no choice, but to uh, place the Cathars in caves, secretly, to keep it secret away from the Inquisitors. So, at the age of 80, oh, uh, she was up and about because at the age of 78, it was when her nephew, I can't recall his name, but anyway, her nephew, he married Emmergaard of Narbonne. Now, Emmergaard, now there's a story for you, which is continuing on to this day. But Emmergaard was a, a, another remarkable woman because in, in uh, these were times when women they were regarded as very, very second-class citizens apart from in Provence and Languedoc and the Occitan, those areas. But in, in, in the rest of Europe, they were, they were uh, you bought a woman just like you bought a pig or a chair or what have you. Uh, it was just something that you took into the family. Love was, it was a cathars who brought back love and uh, elevated women to where they should be, equal place with men. Uh, and, uh, for instance, uh, the, in, I don't remember the date, but it was the, it was a debate at Montreal. It was the last debate. There was a number of debates, but there was the last debate between the, the, the Catholics, uh, the Catholic Church and the Cathars and uh, heading the, the Catholic debate was uh, Dominic Guzman, who later became Saint Dominic, and he's the founder of the Dominicans. And the main orator for the Cathars was the renowned uh, Bishop Gulabat de Castro. It's thought by some that Esclamont actually organised those debates, or this debate anyway. At the debate, she stood up to speak, which is nat natural for a Cathar woman, and especially a, a priestess, and a lady of distinction, an aristocrat, <laughs> such as uh, uh, Esclamon de Foy. I mean, Foy was a, it was a very powerful aristocratic family in the Occitan, in Occitania. She just stood up to speak, and Saint Dominic, <laughs> good old Dominic Guzman, he said, Get, woman, get back to your distaff. He said, you have no right to speak in these matters. Your distaff, get back to your spinning. Uh, get back to the kitchen to your spinning. You know, get back where you belong, women, in the kitchen. Pregnant and in the kitchen. Uh, so, that would have been uh, uh, counterproductive because any women there, Catholic or Cathar, would have said, well, <laughs> this is how this is the future for women in the Catholic Church, and, and it still remains the same today. They're still second-class citizens. I don't think we'll ever see a female pope. Being hunted for all that time, at, uh, she was frail, 80 years old, and literally her body was giving out on her. So at some friend's house in a little village, small village, still there today, since that, in the Ridge Valley, she died. And there she was, her, her, a woolen blanket was her shroud, and then they, uh, they took her off and they were buried in a secret cave. Now, what's interesting is, it's the same cave that Gulabat de Castro, who was her teacher, her mentor and friend and uh, it's where he was buried and in fact they're buried alongside each other. This is not written in the history books. How do I got I got when I've explained that I do communicate with guides, Cathar guides, and they can fill me in with details, which is great. And of course, 
this is the whole point of Gnosticism, but especially Catholicism, that at some point, if you're serious about it, that you will, you must, if you continue and you're serious, you must at some point get a connection with the divine, with normally your, 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 your guides. We're not very good at speaking to Jesus or, 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 or Moses or Muhammad or Abraham or anyone like that, Buddha, but we do and we connect with our guides. Now this is not uh, uh, an un uncommon thing. I mean, Carl Jung, the father of psychology, I'm digressing for a second, but uh, his guides were very, very uh, one stage, they <laughs> bashing on the windows and knocking on the doors and their family were a bit uptight until he organized that, just said that they are these guides and he had his guide, Philemon, and, and, uh, and he's, he's the father of psychology, but he was 52 before uh, he was game enough to, to say that he was a Gnostic, uh, not a Cathar, but that he, he, he was a Gnostic. But these days, one can go out and one can say and, and uh, stand up with uh, pride or whatever and, and state that uh, you're a Gnostic and, and, and even better if you're, you're, a, you're a Cathar. So it's an advantage. And in fact, the illustration that you've got of Escaramon de Foy, uh, in that, just quickly, uh, when I was told that uh, she looked, her face was similar to uh, to uh, Gina Lodi Brigida, but her eyebrows were more fine, and and uh, uh, her, her skin was white. So, that, and of course, I knew that she had the red hair. So that laid, that allowed me to make a composite, and that's the illustration that you're seeing of Esclaramon de Foix. Uh, there's another illustration, and this is the medieval uh, idea of what uh, Esclaramon de Foix looked like. But, uh, you can see that my illustration and this one are worlds apart. As I said before, she was an extra, extraordinary woman. She really elevated Catharism because of her position uh, and her intelligence. She was extremely well educated in philosophy and other things which were unusual for women at that time. So she really took uh, women to another level and the fact that she she organized these hospitals and uh, schools and uh, old people's homes for widows and uh, aging uh, aging perfecti. Now she was she was a she was, a, she was out there and she was a, a uh, she, she was uh, uh, making things happen. If one delves into the history of medieval Catharism, Esclamon de Foix is an integral part of that history. And she's up there with those others, Gilbert de Castro, Bertram Hardy, Right and Monsiva, Omni Dinobors, to name a few. Hers is a great story. Bye for now. Talk soon.